Welcome to Know Your Stuff, a program aimed at providing historical context and educating on societal issues. My name is Zan Raza. Today we are joined by Peter Kuzdek, Professor of History and a Director of Nuclear Studies Institute at the American University. He's also the author of the book called The Untold History of the United States, which he wrote together with Hollywood film director and producer Oliver Stone. Peter Kuznak, glad to have you on again. Glad to be with you. Let us by, begin by examining the first chapter of your book called World War I, Wilson versus Lenin. Without getting into the geopolitics at first, can you talk about A, the general sediment in the United States before the US entered into World War I, and B, can you also define and examine the role of the Committee on Public Information, CPI, which is also known as the Creel Commission, that you argue in your book played an influential role in shaping public opinion for the government to enter into war. Uh, yeah, and, and the two questions really go together because the attitude in the United States was people did not want to get involved in World War I. We saw this slaughter going on in Europe. There was nothing that was appealing. You saw trench warfare in which young men were being mowed down by machine guns as they fought over a few feet each direction. We saw poison gas being used in large amounts and the effects on people were just horrific. Uh, so the attitude in the United States, even before the war, wasn't just the United States. Globally, the assumption was that civilization had advanced to the point when people would never go to war against each other. This was the time when you had the great second international. So you had the uh, big European labor parties and socialist parties who were part of this. And what they said was, they're not gonna go to war for their capitalist masters. If, there's a, if the capitalists declare war, then rather than killing workers in other countries, they're gonna go on a general strike against their governments. Some countries, uh, the leaders said that we're going to make turn this into a communist or a socialist revolution and overthrow the capitalists entirely. We saw that with Rosa Luxemburg in Germany. We saw that with Lenin and Trotsky in Russia. So there was a sentiment that we would never go into this war. And then it was a tragedy, uh, beginning with the SPD in Germany uh, and then the French socialists. They all started to support, vote for war credits and support the war effort. The attitude in Germany is we have to protect our country against the Russian hordes, these barbaric Russians. Uh, and so then country after country lined up for the war and they sent their boys off to slaughter each other for greed and glory and God and profits and the motherland. It was so demoralizing for on a planetary basis that people would choose to be killing other working men just like themselves in the name of nationalism, in the name of capitalism, in the name of greed. Uh, and so the attitude the United States watch this. And when the Europeans go to war in 1914, the United States stays out. And the United States doesn't enter the war until April of 1917. So by that point, uh, there was a strong anti-war sentiment in the United States. Wilson got elected, Woodrow Wilson got re-elected in 1916 on the basis that he kept the United States out of the war. And he, that was his campaign slogan. But deep down, he knew that he wanted the US to get involved in the war. And so they called when, they, when the United States declared war on, uh, I think it was, April 2nd, 1917, the, uh, they called for a million volunteers. They got 73,000 after six weeks. So people were not lining up. They were not ready to go and fight in that, that under those horrific conditions. Uh, but eventually they drafted and two million Americans eventually went off to war. Uh, it was, again, in some ways, the worst war ever. Uh, World War II had more casualties. World War II had its own atrocities, the Holocaust, the atomic bombs. So we could say that World War II was in some ways the most horrific war ever. But we could also say that about World War I because it demoralized civilization. 
We thought we were beyond solving problems with war. But what was going on? We had uh, the, the Br Europeans were fighting over the colonies. There's a tremendous increase in colonization of the planet in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And Germany was a newcomer. And Germany's economy was developing very rapidly. And they were challenging the Brits in steel production and coal and all manufacturing. British were not investing in new industry and technology. The Brits were off in Africa and other places with a stagnant economy and trying to expand by colonization and exploiting and stealing the, the uh, resources and labor from those countries. One of the startling facts to me was that in 1914, only 1% of young British men were graduating high school. I looked it up in the United States at the same time, 9% were graduating high school. British economy was stagnant, British society was stagnant, rigid class barriers, not a lot of social mobility. And so, so uh, I said, but then you've got these new up and coming countries like Germany and Japan, and they wanted a piece of the action. The world was not able to find a way to integrate them and to give them their, what they considered a fair cut of colonies or profits or investments and resources. And so the, really World War I is a war to redivide the colonies and redistribute the colonies and the wealth of the colonies. It's not a war for higher ideals. It's not a war for greater purposes. That's why we needed the Creel Committee, the Committee for Public Information, because we needed to sell this war to the American people. World War I is the first large scale example of government run propaganda and propaganda was lies. And so the Creel Committee started to do this massive propaganda campaign to try to convince the American people to support the war. The idea was that the British and the French treated their colonies nobly and, uh, and, and were very, very generous to their colonies, but the British and the Austro-Hungarians were brutal to their colonies. They were bloodthirsty and look at the terrible things they did, bayoneting babies and all kinds of horrible things. So it's a massive propaganda effort. There were 75,000 uh, volunteers. They were called four minute men. And they would go around, make speeches, uh, shopping centers, on streetcars, in churches, in the schools, every place the public gathered, movie lines, and they would make speeches talking about the virtues of the allied cause and the horrors of the enemy's cause. And they try to basically convince the American people that this was a noble effort. The American people were not buying it. And so the government took even more extreme measures that we can talk about. Yeah, let's talk about that. Can you uh, continue uh, your discussion on the Creel Commission? Well, the Creel Committee, uh, it did a number of things. Uh, it was headed by George Creel, who was a newspaper man from Denver, Colorado. And in addition to the four minute men and their propaganda, the Creel Committee put out reports. And one of the reports, the next to last report they issued was about the uh, German Bolshevik conspiracy. And it, they republished documents that had been long known as fraud, fraudulent as forgeries in Europe, uh, but they published them as if they were true. And the idea was that Lenin and Trotsky were purged, were paid German agents on the German payroll. And then they went back in the interest of Germany to uh, spread this revolution and get Russia out of the war. Well, Russia does leave the war after, and they, they signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was a terrible treaty for Russia, for the Soviet Union at that point. But Lenin and Trotsky were so desperate to get their country out of the war that they were willing to take the hit that that treaty imposed on them. Uh, the Russian people were going to war without uniforms, without boots, without rifles. They, they, this, but they were suffering. You know, we're going to talk probably about poison gas. 
and it was the Russians who suffered the most from the poison gas that was used. It was the Russians who suffered the most casualties, the Russians who suffered the most deaths, uh, and they weren't in a position to protect themselves. So the Tsar had allowed the this uh, F war effort to continue, and then after the Menshevik Revolution, they still stayed in the war effort. So the Western countries, the Allies, were very happy to have Russia there, the Russian troops as cannon fodder, the Russians holding off the uh, Germans, at least in part of that war effort. Uh, so when Lenin and Trotsky pulled the Soviet Union, pulled Russia out of the war, the West went apoplectic. And one of the things that we'll probably talk about is the Western intervention into the Soviet Union to try to stop the Soviet, the Russian Revolution. Uh, it was one of the turning points in history. So how was the state of dissent uh, during that time in the U.S. particularly? Were there movements, campaigns or influential figures um, that tried to stop the U.S. Uh, war once the U.S. entered into it? And how did the, if at all, did the government intervene and, uh, and try to clamp down on the dissent? There was strong dissent in the United States. In the election of 1912, the Socialist Party won numerous uh, mayor, mayoral elections, city council elections. People were elected to Congress from the Socialist Party during this period. So you had the Socialist you also had the, the strong labor movement, the IWW, the uh, International Workers of the World, uh, was very powerful during this time. And they were both anti-war and, and were organizing across the country. Uh, there, there were this very strong anti-war movement. In fact, in 1915, the most popular American song was the song, I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier. Teddy Roosevelt hated that song. He said, that song makes as much sense as a song titled, I Didn't Raise My Girl to Be a Mother. You know, Roosevelt always was waving the bloody flag and wanting to get into the wars. In fact, when, when World War I broke out, Roosevelt asked Wilson for permission to raise a volunteer battalion and take them over to Russia. In fact, Roosevelt had four sons, all of whom volunteered for the war effort, two of whom were wounded and gassed. And Roosevelt's youngest son, 20-year-old Quentin, uh, was actually killed when his plane was shot down. Teddy Roosevelt never recovered from that. He died six months later. He was a broken man. And he had some realization of how terrible this was. In the same sense that Rudyard Kipling, you know, the proponent of, of British empire, white man's duty, uh, white man's obligation to go and, and civilize the heathens, white man's burden, as he called it. Uh, uh, he also encouraged his young son to volunteer for the war. And his son's first day in combat, he was killed. Uh, afterwards, uh, Kipling wrote his epitaph for the war. And he wrote there, if any question why we died, Tell them because our fathers lied. So, so, you had, so there was strong anti-war sentiment and the government repressed it. It was repressed, they passed legislation. The as Espionage Act of 1917, the Sedition Act of 1918, the amended Espionage Act, which banned basically anti-war protests. Anybody who spoke out against the war could be jailed. Anybody who opposed the war bonds could be jailed. Anybody who spoke out against the draft could be jailed. And people were by the hundreds, by the thousands. And in fact, not only that, but they also cracked down on freedom of speech throughout society. The campuses, the campuses went silent. The campuses, they, they banned as Nicholas Murray Butler, the president of Columbia said, well, Freedom of speech and academic freedom might have been a luxury we had before the war. But now if anybody on our campus speaks out against the war, he's going to be fired or thrown out of school. And so uh, very quickly, two leading Columbia faculty members, James McKean Cattell, one of the country's leading psychologists, and Henry, da Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Dana, the grandson of the poet, were both thrown out of 
the fire from the Columbia faculty. There was huge protests and opposition. Charles Beard resigned in protest. America's leading historian resigned in protest. He was supporting the war effort, but he said this kind of crackdown on freedom of speech cannot be tolerated. And others supported him and, and resigned in protest. So this was, you had a, a period here when civil liberties were out the window, freedom of speech out the window, academic freedom out the window, and people were being thrown in jail. Uh, among them was Eugene Debs, the leader of the Socialist Party. He went to Canton, Ohio, to the prison there where three socialists were in jail for speaking out against the war. He made a, a famous anti-war speech before a huge crowd there, and then they brought charges against him. They convicted him for a 10-year sentence for his opposition to the war and speaking out against the war. And he said, he said, let the capitalists furnish their own corpses and there'll never be another war. Let them send their own sons off to fight and their fellow capitalists off to fight. There'll never be another war. But he says, instead, what do they do? They send the sons of workers off to kill the sons of other workers in other countries. And he wasn't going to remain silent in the face of that. I wish we had that kind of protest going on now, right? How long has the United States been uh, involved in the war in Afghanistan? Uh, 17, 18 years already? Is there a strong protest on the campuses? I haven't seen it. My university, American University, keeps getting named by the Princeton Review, the most politically active campus in America. And what I tell my students is that the most politically active campus in 2019 is less active than the least politically active campus was in the late 1960s. Uh, it's, I mean, we, there's just, I mean, there's a lot of concern about environmental issues, and that's great, gender equality, uh, racial issues, but not about war and peace issues. And that to me is, is appalling right now. You know, I have to comment on that, that I find it appalling as well because the military industrial complex, the budget is is staggering. I think it's somewhere between 1.4 to $2 trillion a year. And yet there's so little focus on that because it could actually, if we would take that money out and put it in social or climate things, would change so much. But getting back uh, to World War I, uh, I want to take a step back and talk about uh, the backdrop. Uh, Things that are not mentioned in historical literature, at least here in Germany, about World War I, is the commercial interest as well as the interest of war profiteers that, uh, and what role they played during World War I. Could you provide your assessment on this? Sorry, right, just throw out some numbers. The U.S. banks had loaned $2.5 billion to the Allies and only $27 million to the central powers. Uh, the US was selling by 1917, $3 billion to uh, Britain and France and selling less than a million dollars to Germany and Austria-Hungary. So it was clear that there was a financial motivation for getting involved in this war. I, you know, when, and Wilson saw it more as a diplomatic issue. What Wilson said to his critics was that if the United States remains neutral, we're going to have no influence in shaping the post-war world. He says, all I'll be able to do is yell through a crack in the door. But if we get involved in the war, then we'll be at the table and I can shape the post-war world according to my vision. And Wilson's vision was in some ways a relatively noble one, had he actually lived up to any of that. But it wasn't going to happen. Uh, when the Soviets took over, when the Russians took over, the Bolsheviks took over, one of the first things they do, did is they went into the foreign ministry and exposed all the secret treaties that were already into place. The main one, the Sykes-Picot Treaty between British, the French, and the Russians talked about how they're going to divide up the colonies. They're going to divide up the Ottoman Empire, divide up the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire. Uh, and, and this was what they actually ended up doing at Versailles. So all of, tr of Wilson's highfalutin uh, rhetoric about making the world safe for democracy, the war to end all wars, we're gonna end colonialism, bullshit, none of that happened. In fact, the United States actually even took over the, uh, 
trusteeship for Armenia. They, they, uh, Lloyd George and Clemenceau joke. They said, "Well, we'll call Wilson the Grand Turk after the after the war." Uh, so the United States went along with all of that. Uh, Wilson did not fight for the 14 points. Germany surrendered based on the 14 points. Germany thought that this would be a non-punitive treaty, that there would be the things that they called for, freedom of the seas, free trade, disarmament, uh, self-determination. Did that happen? No, that didn't happen after the war. Uh, and, and so there were a lot of ideals that were expressed but they weren't lived up to in the Treaty of Versailles. What happens in the Treaty of Versailles? The place was overrun by Morgan's agents. It was Morgan and the Morgan banking interests who were the ones who were calling the shots before the war. They were the ones who had, they were the official British banking agents. All of that vast amount of money that the British purchases they were making was going through the Morgan banks. This was all money in Morgan's coffers. You know, it's, it's, there was something obscene about this. Some people were making billions of dollars of profits, or at least uh, millions of dollars of profits, many millions of dollars of profits off the blood that was being shed among in, in throughout the war. You know, and that, that's that's the ugliness of war. That that there are people now. Every time the United States sets, so shoots off another drone in uh, Afghanistan or. Uh, in Syria or any place where we're doing this, in Northern Africa, uh, people are making profits off of that. So, uh, so clearly the United States, if it was going to get involved, was going to get involved on the side of the allies where our financial interests were and more of our countrymen came from those areas. Uh, but there was a, this propaganda campaign, I should mention what was going on. It was so anti-German, this propaganda effort, German language <clears throat> was removed from the high school and college curricula. German music was removed from the uh, repertoires that were being portrayed, played by American orchestras. Sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage. Uh, German measles now became Liberty Measles. Hamburgers were now Liberty Sandwiches. Uh, German shepherds were now renamed Police Dogs. I mean, there was this, we saw some of that happening after Britain uh, and after Germany and France refused to support the United States in the invasion of Iraq in the cafeteria in the, in the uh, Senate, uh, uh, French fries were renamed freedom fries. I mean, the same kind of thing is happening in 2003 that happened in 1917 and 1918. This kind of blind patriotic nonsense uh, that takes over during war. And so when people are being lynched, what we had is you had mobs breaking into the Socialist Party headquarters, the IWW headquarters around the country. People like Frank Little were being lynched. The Washington Post as well. But we're really excited to see this patriotism in the American heartland. And he said, if the, and they said, wrote, if a few lynchings are the price we have to pay, so be it. We're willing to accept that price. It was, it was a very ugly period in the United States and the period afterwards with the Palmer raids and the <clears throat> jailing and the uh, throwing the Russian foreign radicals out of the country and stop shutting down the, uh, the labor movement, the, the left wing movements. We went through a period between 1920 and 1933 or so in which the left is largely wiped out in the United States because of this, this kind of repression. For our young viewers, there was, a, I think, first time use of chemical weapons and increased use of aerial warfare in World War I. Can you provide a detailed account of this and also talk about what ramifications it had on the battlefield and also on international diplomacy? Uh, the first real use of chemical weapons was in <laughs> Uh, a Balamau in Russia, and it was done by Germany, but it was not terribly successful. The first successful use, and when usually when people talk about the start of chemical warfare, they point to Ypres, Belgium, 
the Second Belgian War, the Second War Battle of Ypres, and Germany did use uh, chlorine gas very effectively against the French troops. The headlines in the United States was that the French soldiers were dying in anguish. They were turning blue and green and yellow and suffocating and going insane from the horrors of the poison gas that was being used. The British tried to get revenge against Germany in the Battle of Luz, but the wind shifted and it blew back on the British troops. So that, but there was a lot of use of poison gas when the United States gets in the war in 1917, we set up the Chemical Warfare Service. And uh, the, my university, American University, became the staging ground for all of this. The, the chemists flooded into American University. They constructed and took over 60 buildings and they began to do the chemical warfare research. Uh, it was then weaponized at the Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. And the American chemical warfare, by, by 1918, the US was producing three times as much as Britain, France, and Germany combined. Uh, and they had increasingly deadly kinds of mustard gas and leucocyte and other gases that were being produced. The person who headed the program at the Edgewood Arsenal was a General Walker who had been a professor of chemistry at, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he said that by the end of the war, we had produced these uh, one ton mustard gas canisters that if we dropped them with our, through airplanes over a German city, the entire city would be wiped out. There'd be nothing left alive, not even a rat. He said when, when the war ended before they could be used, he said, we felt as if we had been cheated of our prey. Uh, they wanted to use it. In fact, there were enormous amounts of chemical weapons on the docks ready to be shipped uh, for use against Germany in the war. But the war ended too soon and they regretted it. After the war, there was great effort nationally to ban the use of poison gas and chemical warfare again. But the American chemists, the American chemical industry was opposed to it. They opposed the Geneva Protocols to ban chemical warfare. And even though the rest of the world adopted it, the United States did not, never signed on. And I don't think Japan ever did either. So um, there was at least coming to an awareness. It's so different. The chemists led the fight against the Geneva Protocols. After World War II, you're going to have the nuclear physicists leading the fight for abolishing and banning nuclear weapons. The opposite after World War I, the chemists felt that they were the soldiers of democracy. And they were finally being appreciated. And there were editorials in the New York Times or others who did applaud them and thank them for their great sacrifice for the war effort. Following World War I, there was a congressional proposal in 1934 to investigate individuals as well as corporations from profiting of war. Uh, yeah. Could you talk about uh, this investigation, provide us some context, its findings, and where it eventually led to? Uh, Senator Gerald Nye, Senator from Nebraska, uh, led a bipartisan effort at the time, beginning in 1934, extending through 1936. They actually had hearings, and the debate was, if war broke out again, the war had become very unpopular. After World War I, the sentiment throughout the United States was that we had been bamboozled, we'd been tricked, dragged into this horrible war. And it wasn't a war for greater ideals or for democracy. It was a blood war. People can make their blood profits. In fact, the manufacturers, munitions makers, were called merchants of death widely throughout society. That's what they are. That's what they should be called now, merchants of death. They should be on trial before in the Hague. They shouldn't be allowed to profit off of this. Uh, but that's what these people do. And there was an awareness to look at the movies, movies like The Big Parade, great movie for I think 1926. Um, the great, a lot of terrific movies were coming out during this period and they were anti-war and there were anti-war songs and anti-war books and plays and poems, E.E. Uh, e. Cummings and others. Uh, so uh, by 1934, the sentiment was strongly opposed to 
profiting off war. So Gerald and I held these hearings and uh, they called in the DuPonts. The DuPonts profits, according to one New York Times headline, was DuPont profits up 800 percent because of the war manufacturing. These people were considered what they were, scum of the earth, slime, vermin. Uh, and subhuman. And, and so that was the widespread attitude in the United States during this period. And so the proposals were either for if war broke out, the first day of war nationalized the entire arms industry so they couldn't profit off it, or else uh, raised, a, 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 they wanted to have a 98% tax on all uh, incomes over, over $10,000 in the event war broke out again. So people couldn't profit off this. There was a survey done to the American people, I think this was in 1936, because uh, the hearings went on, uh, and 82% wanted to abolish all profits from war and wanted to nationalize the industry in the event that war broke out, 82%, 18% were opposed. So this was the overwhelming sentiment. The attitude was that World War I was a horrible war. And that's part of why the Americans were so slow to get involved in World War II, which in my opinion was a necessary war, given what Germany was doing and what Japan was doing. Uh, not a, you know, in the US we call it the good war. I don't think there is ever any such thing as a good war, but if there is any, a war that's justifiable, this was the one war that was. Uh, and, uh, but there was a strong anti-war sentiment. The Americans did not want to get dragged into another uh, nonsensical waste for war in Europe. And so they were slow to wake up to what was actually happening there. Um, we could have stopped it earlier. Had we gotten involved in the, on the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War, we could have defeated the Germans and the Italians there. Unfortunately, the only country that came to the Spanish Republic's aid was the Soviet Union. Uh, and there were a lot of issues around that as well. But in, when the Italy began its efforts in, in uh, uh, Libya, I mean, there were a lot of places where we could have intervened to stop this. But instead, we stuck to our dumb neutrality. And Roosevelt later recognized what a mistake that was. <clears throat> but so, so the hearings go on for a couple of years. Finally, <coughs> they turn against the uh, Nye committee efforts because they start to blame Wilson for lying the United States into the war. Wilson did lie the United States into the war, but the Democrats said this was too much. We can't tolerate that. Then you've got 76 year old or 78 year old Carter Glass, senator from Virginia, going before the Senate and starting pounding the, his desk saying, how dare you de defame our great leader, Woodrow Wilson, he's pounding the desk so hard, the blood is spurting out of his hand all over uh, as he's pounding the desk. And this is what's going to turn the debate uh, against the proposals for uh, abolishing profits from war, nationalizing the industry. It's crazy. There are certain industries, certain issues that people should not be able to profit off of. One is sickness. Second is war and militarism. Um, I mean, there are others also, but uh, this is a basic decency kind of question. And these people now, they still advertise, they lobby in order to get the United States and other countries involved in wars. Uh, and the United States has an enormous defense budget. Of course, we should be cutting that in half, at least for starters. Uh, but Trump's budget is a record breaking budget. So instead of doing what needs to be done, what we need in the United States is a Green New Deal. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and others have been advocating. Uh, and how are we going to finance that? By, by raising taxes on the wealthy, instead of Trump giving a $2 trillion tax cut to the wealthiest Americans, we'd be, have to be raising taxes. We need a wealth tax. And we need to be cutting the military budget and using that for something productive. Banning wartime profits, something very unthinkable today. But what an interesting discussion. We hope to continue it with you in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Good to see you again. And thank you guys for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to donate.
so we can continue to produce independent and non-profit news and analysis. My name is Zen Raza. See you guys next time. <laughs>